Okay, so we'll go ahead now and we're going to talk about Galatians chapter 6. It's the uh, last chapter in the book of Galatians. Um, I have been so blessed going through Galatians. I, I've, this is the first time I've really dug into Galatians quite like this and just, wow. I mean, incredible truth. Incredible truth Paul's unveiling. And so it just, you know, he, he, we just going to, you know, Chapter 5 was powerful, but chapter 6 is also really good. And so we're going to jump right in. Paul's talking here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. He says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. So the idea that Paul has in mind is that you have now crucified your flesh, you are now walking orderly in the, on the narrow path that leads to life following the Holy Spirit. You don't just have His life, but you're actually living by His life. You're drawing from His life. You now have the body life functioning with each other. You've crucified pride. You crucified jealousy and selfish ambition. You're walking in that unity of the Spirit with your brothers. And He's saying now, okay, now the ones who are spiritual... Well, what does he mean by spiritual? Well, he uses the very same term in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When Paul talks about there's three different types of believers, there is the soulish believer, there is the carnal believer. The soulish believer is led by their emotions, led by their mind, led by their wants. The carnal believer is led more by their body desires, what their eyes see, what their ears hear, what their mouth craves and all that. And there's also the spiritual believer, the spiritual believer being the one led by the Spirit, the spiritual believer being the one who has taken up the cross, being the one who by the power of the Spirit has put, the de put to death the deeds of the flesh so that they will live. So the spiritual Christian is the one who is allowing the Spirit of God in them to live. Those who are yielding to the Spirit of God, those who are fully yielding and living and, you know, every breath that, that they take is in obedience to the Spirit. They are led by the Spirit in everything they do. They live by intuition. They live in communion. They live in fellowship with the Spirit of God. They don't live and operate out of their mind, will, and emotions. They, don't, they aren't led by their bodily cravings. They're led by the intuitive communing knowledge that comes through intimacy with the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be spiritual. And so Paul says those who are spiritual, those who are doing this, restore someone with gentleness. That means when, if someone's in sin, someone's struggling with anger, someone's struggling with pornography, someone's struggling with jealousy or depression or whatever it is, you know, maybe they, whatever it would be, they've let, you know, they're in an affair or whatever it is, you know, what Paul's saying here is don't go with this tone of judgment. Don't go in this tone of condemnation. Go in this attitude of gentleness. Go to try to restore them first in their relationship to Jesus Christ, second, in the relationship with their family or anyone else they have damaged by their sin, third, in the relationship to the church, and then fourth, if they are in ministry, you know, that, you know, this could be years down the road after they've recovered, after they've gotten, you know, they've walked in victory, then restore them into ministry. And sadly, a lot of people want to restore fallen ministers really quick into ministry. And I just think, that the scriptures are clear is we need to not be hasty to lay hands on anyone so we don't share in their sins. But the attitude we want to have is to have that, that attitude of gentleness, that attitude of meekness, knowing, okay, hey, we're walking in the spirit now, but, you know, we have a sin nature. It's not been completely eradicated. There is still a sin nature at work in me. And you go one day, you go two days, you go three days when you don't crucify your flesh. And I'm sure we've all done that. You realize very quickly there is at work within you the principle of sin and death in your body. And so Paul's saying, it, just go knowing that you can be tempted like, just like they are. So you don't come in condemnation. You don't come in judgment. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So here's interesting. 
is we've seen throughout Galatians, Paul has described the law as a yoke. A, a wooden instrument that bound together two animals together. And he said, before Christ, the law was, you were yoked together to, to, to uh, tablets of stone with Ten Commandments on them. You must do this, and you must do that. In other words, you were weighed down with guilt, shame, and condemnation. But Jesus invites us to say, he says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble in heart. My burden, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your soul. See, and now Paul says, okay, you, you know, you, you now have replaced the heavy burden of the law with Jesus and his relationship with Jesus, a face-to-face intimate communing relationship with the person, you've replaced that, that external compliance that has been so prevalent for so many years, you have replaced that with an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But now Paul says, bear one another's burdens. So Paul is saying to us, not only are we to exchange our yoke, but we're to help others when they are in distress. See, someone's struggling financially, someone's struggling in their marriage, someone is struggling in relationships, someone's struggling in their job or with their kids, someone is struggling in ministry or, you know, in spiritual warfare or in their health or whatever it would be, a million reasons we could list. And Paul's saying, the body of Christ, you're not there just to take care of your own needs. You're not to come to church as, just, as if it's just an event or a service you go to for two hours a week. You're to get up under the load that other people are carrying, and now as the body, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as one spiritual family in Jesus Christ, you are to share the load and the burden they carry by carrying it with them. That's a challenge, isn't it? That's not really done a lot in the, in the church today, is it? It, it? it definitely convicts me. It definitely moves me to say, okay, how am I bearing the burden of others? You know, how are we bearing the burden of others? This is something the whole body, if, if one member in the body is suffering, we all suffer. If one member in the body is going through something, the body itself is to get up under that burden that they're going through and to carry that burden with them. They're part of our family. And so Paul's saying, if you do that, this is so beautiful, you will fulfill the law of Christ. That is awesome. The law of Christ. We have the law of Moses, and we have the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? I believe it's what Jesus said in, uh, in John. John chapter, we've looked at this already. John chapter 13, verse 34. The law of Christ is the new commandment that Jesus gave to love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, we looked at this in uh, Galatians 5.14, is Jesus, his new command to love, this is very important, his new commandment to love does not redefine what sin is and what sin isn't. His new commandment to love does not redefine what righteousness is and what righteousness is not. The law has defined what sin is and what sin is not. And that, def that defining, even though we're dead to the law, even though we're not under the law, the definition of sin does not change ever. Ever. God, what God defined in the law does not change what, what we're talking about here is now having the Spirit of God and Him living rather than us. We now have the enablement starting internally to fulfill the external requirements the law demands. And we're, I'm talking about especially the moral law. Honor. Uh, you know, uh, not blaspheming. Not coveting, 
not committing immorality, all those different things. That begins internally by the Holy Spirit. So the law of Jesus Christ does not redefine the law of Moses. The law of Jesus Christ, which is love, empowers us to keep the requirements in the law. And so I've seen it. <clears throat> I mentioned this in the last, one of the last sessions that people claiming Jesus' new commandment to love, and all of a sudden there's this slippery slope of we don't even define, we don't even know what sin is anymore. If two men love each other, they can get married. If two women love each other, they can get married. If I love five women, I can marry all five. That's not what Jesus' commandment means at all. It does not redefine sin. It empowers us to fulfill what the law demands and what it dictates. See, what we're, what we're, what's becoming clear in the book of Galatians is that one of God's ultimate goals for us is that we would learn to walk in love. Love for God first, love for each other second. If we keep those two simple commandments wholeheartedly, we will fulfill the entire law, all 613 commandments. In fact, Paul told Timothy, one of his last letters, he said, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. See, love is what God is moving us towards. God is wanting to mature us in love. <clears throat> God is wanting to cause us to love one another even as Jesus has loved us. So we would love one another. So just to summarize real quick what Paul has been teaching about the law, about bearing burdens, is I'm just going to read this from the notes just real quick or, or summarize it from the notes real quick. Is we've died to the law in the body of Jesus Christ so we can bear fruit for God. Therefore, we are no longer under the law. We are no longer under the heavy yoke of the law for Jesus. We've exchanged it for Jesus' light and easy yoke. The law, as our child trainer, prepared us to receive the blessing of Abraham, which is the indwelling spirit. But now that we are alive by the spirit, now that we possess his life, it's imperative that we crucify our flesh and walk orderly in obedience to the spirit. When we do this, the Spirit's love is produced within us, empowering us to love one another, to serve one another in love, and to carry one another's burdens. This is how we fulfill the requirements of the law and thereby ultimately fulfill the law of Christ. It's incredible. Now in verse 3, Paul is saying here, Paul is saying that if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. See, it's interesting again, just like we saw in, in, at the end of chapter 5, it's interesting that now live by, living by the Spirit in the body life is going on naturally and organically. Paul gives another warning, and it's pretty similar to the warning he just gave, is don't think you're something when you're nothing. Don't think you're something special. It's going gonna, it's gonna to really bring disunity into the body of Jesus Christ. When you are nothing, don't think you're something. Don't get into self-deception. Here's, here's what he says, verse 4. Each one must examine his own work, and then he, will bo then he can boast in regard to himself, but not to another, for each one must bear his own load. Well, what Paul's getting at here is he's not saying now you got to carry your own load in terms of the heavy yoke of the law, or you know we saw that we're, we're to carry one another's load and yoke uh, by by helping others fulfill the, the the heavy burden on us. What Paul's saying, basically, what I believe he's saying is, listen, you're going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We are going to have to give an account for everything we did in the body, whether good or bad. And everything that is done that was not of Christ, that was of the soul, is going to be burned. It's going to go up in flames. It's going to be lost forever. That's sobering. 
Paul's saying, look, don't get proud about anything you've accomplished. Don't get proud about anything you've done. You are going to have to give an account to God before the judgment seat of Christ. He says, you need to bear your own load. You need to bear your own responsibility and stop judging this person or that person or this person or that person. Do you realize you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? So we'll go on from there. There's more in the notes if you want to see that. But verse 6, this is one of my favorite scriptures as a pastor and a teacher. But the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. So let me just stress that again. Share all good things. Here's what that means. It means 50-yard line tickets to the football game. It means a top-of-the-line espresso maker. It means a lot of money. It means great vacations. It means new cars. It means this and that. No, I'm, I'm, obviously, I'm kidding with you. That doesn't really what it really what it means. But if you want to share that with me, I'll definitely take it. But you know, but it does mean this: that Paul is saying that if someone is teaching you the Word of God, you're to bless them. You know, bless them with encouragement, bless them financially, bless them, you know, give them something, do something for them. And I, I know over the years, you know, as I've been impacted by teachers and I, I, the, the Lord has brought this scripture to my mind. OK, you've been impacted by this certain teacher or this particular person and you haven't done anything to say thank you. You know, even though I'm, I'm greatly um, I'm, I'm so blessed by them and so grateful for what they did. I haven't taken the time to say, hey, thanks. I, I really appreciate you laboring and sharing. And so I try to do this more. And it seems like, honestly, if I, when I do it from the heart with people with different teachers, it's almost like they're shocked to hear that. They're so, you, you know, if you don't teach regularly, you don't understand the warfare people go through and the, you know, the different battles they encounter and things like that. And so, you know, I, I, you know, it's real. The battle's real. And so encouragement, just even encouragement, thank you for teaching me like this. Thank you for sharing with me like this. You know, I've got a, a motto I try to live by is that when you're at a funeral, it's going to do the person who's in the casket no good to hear all the encouraging things you say about them. Say it when they're alive when it can do something, when it can change them, when it can give them courage, it can give them hope. So yeah, I, I think Paul's saying here the same thing he's saying in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, is the elders who rule well and they work hard at teaching and preaching, they're worthy of double honor. And I'm not saying this so I get double honor, I'm just saying as a principle, a principle of honor for, for those who are teaching you the Word of God. Or even, even someone who's an international minister you're being blessed by, you know, you know, say thank you. Maybe give them a love gift or whatever. Just bless them in some way if they're impacting you. All right, we'll move on here. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now, I, I, I sometimes hear, you know, sincere Christians, they love God, they love people, but they're, they're sitting here looking at their life, and they're basically saying, my life is a mess. You know, nothing is going right. And, you know, why is God doing this to me? Or I'm under attack by the devil. Or, you know, it's like I'm either attacked by the devil or God's mean and angry and God doesn't like me. And I sit back and listen and think, okay, well, there actually is a third option you haven't thought about. You're actually living in all the seeds of the flesh you have sown for decades. You're living in the harvest of the flesh you have sown for the past 20, 30 years. I don't, some, I don't usually say that because I want to maintain a relationship with them and they probably wouldn't like that, but I think it. 
You know, a lot of the things we're going through is not necessarily because God is putting us through a trial and it's not necessarily because the devil is attacking us. Those two things could be true. Sometimes it's because we have spent years and years and years sowing to the flesh, sowing to the flesh, and now we're reaping from the flesh corruption. See, a lot of the things we're living through, a lot of the destiny we've experienced right now is based on the choices we've made over the years. Here's how that works. As we begin sowing to the flesh when selfish and sinful beliefs and thoughts are stirring within. It begins with belief. It begins with thoughts. Selfish, sinful thoughts stirring inside of us. Beliefs and thoughts. Those thoughts then become actions. We take action based on that sinful, selfish thought or belief. We take action again, and we begin to develop what then is what Paul described. We begin to practice such a thing as a habit. We begin to, it becomes a, a part of our habit. It's a habit. Ha sinning then becomes a habit. That habit then becomes part of our character, part of our nature. And that character, that sinning, ultimately determines our destiny. That's sobering. Beliefs and thoughts, actions, habits, character, destiny. Well, I want to get out of this. I don't want to be this way. I, you're right. You're, you're exactly right. But what I'm living in right now, what I'm living in right now is the fruit that I have sown the seeds for for years and years and years. How do I get out of this? Well, I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to be honest with you, you're not going to get out of it quickly. Don't mean to discourage you, but there's not a quick solution to it. It begins by cultivating a daily experiential sowing to the Spirit. It's taken you 20 years to get where you are sowing to the flesh. It's not going to be undone in 20 minutes. It's going to take a change of lifestyle, a radical change of lifestyle, to sow to the Spirit. Okay, so what exactly does it mean to sow to the Spirit? It means that we daily, and we can't skip a day, you know? We can't skip a day. We can't afford to skip a day. Daily crucifying our flesh. Daily bringing our flesh to the cross. Daily allowing the Spirit of God in us to live. Daily meditating on the Word. Daily communing with God in prayer. Daily worshiping Him. Daily praying in the Spirit. Daily uh, fellowshipping with Him and letting Him live rather than us. Doing that for, for months and for years and for decades. You will then, Paul says, reap eternal life. And that, you know, a lot of times we think eternal life, die, go to heaven. Well, yes and no. We, it does imply living forever in heaven, but there's something deeper. Eternal life is not our ultimate destination. Eternal life is a person in us that possesses us. See, what Paul's getting at, if you will begin sowing to the Spirit, if you will begin sowing to the Spirit, you're going to reap from the Spirit an increase measure of the life of Jesus Christ. That word eternal means indestructible, or that word eternal means without a beginning or an end. I call it the indestructible, uncreated life of Jesus Christ. You will reap, I'm, I'm telling you, daily sowing to the Spirit, daily meditation, daily 
God, thinking about who you are in Christ, what he's done to your spirit, who dwells inside of you, daily meditating on those things, you will then reap a harvest of the release of the life of God, the Zoe life of God, the abundant life of Christ, what he promised in John chapter 10, you will have life and have it abundantly. You will reap a harvest of overflowing life so much that it can't be contained. That's awesome. That makes me want to say, let's start sowing to the spirit and stop sowing to the flesh. I want the life of God in fullness. I want the life of God in me in fullness, the, the fullness amount I can have of his life. I want that life. And the temptation will come to us. Okay, you're going to have mundane days. You're going to have days when you're like, is it worth it? Is what I'm doing worth it? Is the effort I'm putting in worth it? You know, I pray and it's dead. I pray and it's dry. I pray and I don't feel anything. I pray and it just seems like my prayers bounce off the ceiling. I'm telling you up front, you're going to have days like that. You're going to have seasons like that. Don't quit. Don't quit. Paul says, if you don't grow weary, if you don't grow weary, if you don't quit, you will reap eternal life. You will reap if you do not grow weary. If you don't quit, you are going to have the, the life of Christ increasing in you both now and for all eternity. Now, verse 10. Paul says, so then those... So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. That would be the world and the church. But especially, let's do good to those who are of the household of faith. Paul's telling us, you have limited time. You have limited energy. You have limited money. You have limitations on how much you can give. Paul's telling us, I want you, in terms of your limitations, yes, don't ignore the world, but in terms of your priority, let it be first to the those in the household of faith. You're to carry their burdens. You're to serve them with love. You are to help shoulder what they're going through. Let it be first your best energy saved for your spiritual family. Again, that does not mean we don't do it for the world. We do do it for the world. But... Paul's saying, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now he goes on in verse 11. He says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. See, Paul's telling us right now, the reason the Judaizers traveled so far to come to you was not because they're so concerned that you keep the law of Moses. They don't even keep it themselves. The Judaizers have a motivation. The Judaizers are motivated to make a good showing in the flesh. They, in other words, they want their friends, they want their leaders to go, wow, you are such an anointed man of God. You are so dedicated. You are so loyal in your religious service and endeavors and passion and zeal. And so the second reason is they didn't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. See, Paul was persecuted for the cross. Paul was persecuted because he said to the Gentiles, you don't need to be circumcised. It's Christ plus nothing else. It's not Christ plus this or Christ plus that. Christ plus circumcision. Christ plus obedience. It's Christ. And because of the finished work of the cross and the message that Paul preached, he suffered persecution. Well, the Judaizers didn't want to have that persecution, so they did not preach the cross of Christ. They preached circumcision. And the third thing it was, is, it's pretty graphic, but Paul says, they wanted to boast in your flesh. Think about that. They wanted to boast in your flesh. They wanted what you did in compliance with the law of Moses to be a badge they could wear in front of their religious leaders and in front of their friends showing, look at how special we are. 
Look at how dedicated we are. And Paul's saying it's nonsense. They don't even keep the law themselves. So he goes in verse 14, and he says, But it may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In that reverse from today, we boast in our numbers. How many are you running, brother? How many people are coming to your services, brother? How many baptisms have you done? How many people have been saved? How many are in home groups? How many are you discipling? And we all, we love to boast about the numbers. We're, we're training 3,000 people. We're, you know, we're baptizing, you know, 100 people got baptized last week or whatever. And we love to boast about the numbers. And we claim, well, because lives matter to God, numbers matter to God. And a lot of times the real motive is, no, you really want to make a showing in your flesh so that other people will look at you and say, wow, he's special. Wow, he's anointed. Wow, he's favored. And Paul says, I'm not going to boast in how many people I lead to Christ. I'm going to boast in the fact that I'm going to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's my boast. That's my that's what I'm going to boast in. I'm going to boast in the finished work of Jesus Christ that has justified me. I'm going to boast in the finished work of Jesus Christ by which I'm being sanctified. I'm going to boast in the cross that is both for my justification and my sanctification. I'm going to boast in the cross that is purifying me, making me holy, putting to death myself, putting to death the sin. I'm going to boast in that, not in how many people I've baptized, not in how many people I've discipled. Paul says, now again, I'm not saying you shouldn't keep stats, but it, we, we should never ever boast in those stats. God is not impressed with that whatsoever. He's, God's impressed when Christ is formed in us. That's what impresses God. His son impresses God, not how many things we're doing for God. So Paul says that the cross of Jesus Christ has crucified him to the world. Now it's one thing to be crucified to self. It's one thing to be crucified to the law. It's one thing to be crucified to sin. But it's a whole nother thing to be crucified to the world system. Because now we're talking about the system that affects our everyday life. It affects how we uh, make money and how we spend money. It affects how we are entertained. It goes down to the level of whether we're a patriot, a conservative, a liberal, a globalist, a nationalist. You know, the whole entire world system, the religious system, the system called Christianity, entertainment, sports, all of that, the entire world system. I mean, I don't know many believers that truly can say, you know, they, they might be able to say, I've, I've died to self, I've died to the law, I've died to sin, and I experientially and, and, and coming into greater union with that crucifixion. But to say the world has been crucified to me, that system that we all love, you know, that's a tough one. That, that's something that is progressively happening in me more and more. I think even this uh, coronavirus pandemic has helped put some of the death to the love of the world in me and in us, really, because a lot of the things we used to love, you know, going to eat at restaurants and eating and dining in restaurants or going to watch a game or going here or going there, you know, we just can't get on a plane anymore. I mean, you can, but you are, you're, you're nervous about it. I think God's using that, this pandemic, to help crucify us to this world system. The entire world system is under the control of the evil one. And so the entire world system, economies and religion and, you know, uh, politics and governments and all that is under the control of the evil one. And if our allegiance is with those systems, then we haven't yet been crucified with the world. You know, even in America, we have an election coming up. In November, it's going to be the most important election of our lifetime, without an exaggeration. And I've got a candidate that I'm definitely voting for. But I've got to be to the point where I'm crucified to my patriotism. 
I'm crucified to even my nationalism. I, I've got to just, I've got to be dead to all of that. That doesn't mean I don't vote and take action. I do all that stuff. It doesn't mean I don't pray. I do all that stuff. But it means that the cross is working in me to put me to death. So the world is crucified to me. See, the, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God means we swear allegiance to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. His kingdom come, his kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God above patriotism. Seek the kingdom of God above nationalism. Seek the kingdom of God above America. Seek the kingdom of God above the world systems. See, to swear allegiance to Jesus Christ means it looks like treason to every other system in this world. That's what it means to be crucified to the world and his world system. There's a lot you could say there, but I'm going to move on. I'll say this just real quick. is before the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, the kingdom of self that is reigning within us has to come down so the kingdom of God can be established fully within us. Okay, we'll move on now to Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. Paul says, For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but a new creation. That's a packed, loaded statement. You might just be tempted to scan right over that, but man, there's a lot to, the, to it. Verse 16, Those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. See, Paul's saying here, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew who is circumcised or you're a Gentile who is not circumcised. What you are by what happens to you externally makes no difference to what God wants to do inside of you. What really matters is not what is done to your flesh and to your body. What really matters is what he's done in your spirit, in your soul, in your heart. See, Paul's saying here, what really matters is a new creation. What really matters is now you have the Spirit of God. Now you have a new spirit. Now you have a heart that's been cleansed. In fact, when Ezekiel was talking about the new covenant in Ezekiel 36, uh, 26 through 27, he says, I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to put my spirit within you, and you are going to keep the law. See, let me just read this scripture so we get it. Because really, Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 could really summarize the entire book of Galatians and Paul's main point. Uh, Ezekiel's promise, talking about the new covenant, says, I am going to give you a new heart. I am going to put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, the blessing of Abraham, the indwelling spirit. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep the requirements of the law. If you are led by the spirit, there is no law. If you have love working in you, there is no law. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. See, the new creation Paul's talking about is exactly what Ezekiel is describing is that God would give us a new heart that's soft and pliable. God would put a new spirit within us. God would remove the heart of stone from us. God would put his spirit within us. That's what it means to be a new creation. See, what Paul is getting at here is the same thing he's been driving at in, in, in a couple times in Galatians. If you have the spirit, live by the spirit. If you have the spirit, walk by the spirit. Paul's saying that it doesn't matter whether you, what you do externally to your body. That has no effect whatsoever. Nothing. Whatever you do externally does not matter. Paul is saying what matters is internally, 
You are a new creation. Internally, your spirit is brand new. Internally, your spirit has been raised from the dead. Internally, your spirit is righteous. Internally, your spirit is holy. Your spirit is Christ-like. Your spirit is a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit is one with God. Your spirit is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, the very holy of holies of His temple. That's what matters. And what Paul's saying is those who will walk by this, same thing, same Greek word as in walk by the Spirit. Those who will walk according to the new creation they are in Jesus Christ. Those who will, and he actually uses a Greek word, canon, that means uh, a rod or a straight piece that keeps things straight. And you get the same idea. You kind of just, this ruler here, that you're walking, the the. The, the law of the new creation says walk this way. If you walk that straight, narrow path from who you are as a new creation in Jesus Christ, he says peace and mercy will be on you. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the, uh, the, you know, I think of it, I call it the law of the new creation. There is a law of the new creation. There is different laws that Paul talks about. And when I talk about a law here, I'm talking about the, the condition, like the law of gravity, the law of thermodynamics, the law of aerodynamics. Those different laws, if you throw a ball up, it's going to come down, that law of gravity. There are certain laws that will operate unless there is a greater law to overcome it. By default, the law of sin and death operates in our body. By default, if you just wake up without prayer, without meditation, without seeking the Lord, without inquiring of Him, without being in the Word, by default, you will live in the flesh. You will live by what your body craves and your soul desires. You will live by that, naturally, the law of sin and death. It will lead you to sin. It will produce death. But there is a greater law, the law of the mind. Meditation. Meditating on the Word of God. Meditating on the Spirit of God, meditating on all that is good, meditating of the Spirit inside of you, that then creates, leads to the law of faith. Meditate on every good thing that is within you because of Christ. Meditate on Christ in you. Meditate on Him and your faith will be energized. Your faith will be activated. Your faith will be released. To, and that's what Paul means by the law of faith. That that law of faith then leads to the place of the law of the new creation where your spirit is living. Your spirit is the leader. Your spirit is in control, not your flesh, not your soul, not your body, your spirit. Your spirit is now the leader. Christ and his indwelling life is now your life source. The spirit of God, the indwelling spirit gives you that eternal life. You live by that life, the law of the new creation. There's a lot more I have in the notes that I'm not going to get into here, but you can check those notes out if you want to see more information about it. But it's powerful, powerful, powerful reality. The other thing that Paul mentions here is he says the, he says not only is the blessing of peace and mercy on those who live from their, who they are as a new creation, live from their born again spirit. Paul also says that the blessings of peace and mercy are upon the Israel of God. Now it's important to note that Paul wrote Galatians before Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. And there's a debate, okay, does Paul mean that he, is, is Paul talking about the church is now the Israel of God? Well, I, I think you can look at it and say, well, you got to really consider it, Jerusalem and Israel was still in place. They had not been conquered yet by the Romans. So some people say, well, Paul was ultimately looking as the church being the new Israel, and that opens up a tremendous can of worms. Other people say, no, he's talking about Israel and the Jewish people. To be really honest, I don't think there's enough in this scripture verse, and I've heard both sides of the debate. I, I don't think there's enough in this scripture verse to be dogmatic one way or another about that, in my opinion. But if we really want to know what Paul teaches about Israel and what his view is on Israel, which would solve that whole debate anyway, read Romans 9 through 11 and you'll find out very clearly what Paul believes about Israel and the, the relationship of Israel and the church. You can, and it's way too much to go into right now, but you can look at it later. Romans 9 through 11. 
All right, just to, now we come to the end here. And we come to the end, and Paul says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble. He's talking to the Judaizers. Let them not cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. See, Paul's saying is, is they, want me to be, they want you to be circumcised, but I have something that's even greater than circumcision. I have something that's even greater than that. I have endured pain. I have endured suffering. I have been uh, flogged. I have been beaten for the cross of Jesus Christ. I bear in my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 18, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. God's grace is more than his unmerited favor. God's grace is more than just him imputing righteousness to our account. God's grace is the power of God to be who God has called you to be and the power of God to, to do what God has called you to do. Notice that where grace operates. Grace operates in our spirit. The grace of God be with your spirit. The power of God to do what God has called you to do, to be who God has called you to be, operates from your spirit. The grace of God be with your spirit. Amen. So we'll, we'll end there. God bless you. I really hope you enjoyed this uh, online commentary on the book of Galatians. And uh, hopefully we'll do some other books down in the future. Blessings to you. I'll leave you with what Paul said. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen.